Hello and welcome to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost. We're going out live on UK Health Radio and syndicated out through YouTube, Spotify and all of your favourite podcast platforms. Each week we speak to the best uh, CEOs, leaders, clinicians and founders in the space of health tech who are leading the healthcare revolution in the UK and beyond. I am a CEO and founder of a health tech company myself called PocDoc. We are delivering a step change increase in access to diagnostic testing by allowing anyone with a smartphone to test themselves for major diseases. Um, big thank you to PocDoc for supporting the show, obviously, that we, um, it's the reason why we're on the air. Um, as every week, I want to say thank you to everyone that's either listening live, like I said, on UK Health Radio, or who's watching it on YouTube. So our channel's got well over a thousand subscribers now. So thank you for that. Um, and whether or not you're listening on Spotify, where we're five star rated or any of the other podcast platforms, thank you very much. We wouldn't have this show without you. And I think our latest user statistics showed over 60,000 people were listening live to each show. So thank you very much to everyone for, for joining. Um, so this week we've got a very exciting person on the show. Um, we've only ever had one person from the political world on the show before, which was Matt Hancock who currently is in the jungle. Um, but it's our second politician and or sort of person from the political world. And it's someone that was very prominent during the COVID pandemic. And it's someone that has a, has a real passion for the preventative healthcare space. Uh, he's been a huge health campaigner around innovations, particularly in diagnostics, to try and improve the uh, or reduce the risk of people becoming seriously ill and ending up in hospital by taking early intervention, early detection, early treatment. So um, on today's show, I'd like to welcome uh, former Minister for Innovation and Health Campaigner, Lord Bethel. How are you, James? I've, I was told before I can call you James, so welcome to the show. And can I call you Steve? You may, you may very much call me Steve. <laughs> Steve, yes, it's, it's really great to be here. I'm a big fan of the show, so thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Perfect. So um, as regular listeners know, we generally go into a little bit of backstory and then a little bit around what you're doing and what you have been doing and then um, more kind of like free form kind of discussions. So I think what would be really helpful um, is to understand how you came to be passionate about what you're passionate about as far as health concern. What was your sort of journey to that and over what kind of time frame and what was the inspirations and motivations for that? Well, uh, it was through accident, to be honest, because I was quite happily leading a life of being a whip in the House of Lords, okay. minding my own business, doing legislation in the second chamber. Okay. Uh, when the former life sciences minister, Nicola Blackwood, resigned, and uh, I was called on to replace her. Um, okay. Now, um, Chris Whitty had just come into the room a few days earlier to warn us of... Um, an escalation of the threat of a global pandemic from COVID. And so oh, I arrived wow. in office at literally the time when the pandemic hit us. I actually, uh, didn't now, know, I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that that's when you came in. Wow, what an opening. Now, I had, I had been the whip for health. So I had, right. been, I had been in the gang for okay. six months. But the pandemic literally landed on my desk. You know, you're the life sciences minister. Pandemic is quite a serious affair. <laughs> I mean, it, one one could argue, you know, it's going to be a pretty top priority, right? And um, it was like standing by the fire hydrant and just, you know, plugging yourself in. For okay. Two years. So, and, what, um, sorry, carry on. And it and it was utterly horrific because people died, and it was a a national tragedy in some respects. But personally, it was utterly fascinating, and I worked with remarkable people who did astonishing things and I was really inspired by it and it and it was by far the most important thing I've done in my life I mean wow four children who are fantastic but really um you know it was a hell of a thing and and you can't help but be changed and affected by something like that yeah I mean I think that seems to be pretty consistent across the board in terms of the impact that it had on, on on everyone's lives, not not and not just the people that were working on it. So, what? Um, just to go back a couple of steps, just for everyone listening, what does a whip do generally? What, how would you explain that without wishing to go too into the kind of you know internecine details? But just fundamentally, what? Are you, how would you describe that so everyone's sure. on the same page? So, the House of Lords does two things: it, it it amends legislation, and we do quite a lot to polish up the the the, the, the laws that are sent to us by the House of Commons. Yeah. And it has a challenge role in holding the government to account 
particularly on constitutional type things. Which it did, very House, well, it did it very well during Brexit. Right, so they're very noisy during breakfast. Breakfast, Brexit, probably a little bit sort of um, out of out of um, step with the rest of the country. Mm. Now, of course, the Lords are in there for the rest of their lives. You have tenure. You can't fire a peer. Right. And a lot of them have got quite good lives. So you can't threaten them by taking jobs away. From them. Right. But a whip who's trying to get people to turn up to votes and to speak in debates has really got to cajole and romance and um, persuade their flock to support the government and to um, contribute to um, the processing of legislation. And um, it's fun because you're dealing with people who are of extremely high caliber. You know, whatever you think of the Lords, I can tell you, you're dealing with people who have, are absolutely at the top of their game. Right. Uh, the intellectual challenge uh, is immense. And a lot of them know a, a huge amount about the legislative process. So I yeah. found it a, a fascinating job. And, and when you moved across into health, were you in the government or were you still operating in the Lords? How, how, what, was, were you, yes. what was that like? Right. So a, a whip is in the government. You, okay. are, you are a very junior member of the government, probably. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, but your your focus is very much in uh, the lawmaking processes of Parliament. Okay. Um, I, I did Home Office, Treasury, and Health, so I had three very interesting portfolios. Right. And took a big interest in health and attended a lot of the ministerial meetings and 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 we had some big bills coming through. Of course, the moment the pandemic hit, we had a massive. Um, coronavirus act to take through parliament right it fell on my shoulders as the house of lords minister to take that through so um that was quite a big baptism um, of fire and within that within that legislation was included things the, the powers that the government have that were that were sort of extraordinary for the time in the true sense of the word not in the hyperbolic sense of the word but they were extraordinary powers right well a- actually the way well, it no. turned out um the, the the act did help with um, furlough, and it gave okay. the government um, the financial powers to grant those schemes. It also tidied up some loose ends. But actually, the, the bill itself got overtaken by events. Um, and we relied on a, a bill from, the 19, from 1984, the Public Health Act, to do the big lockdowns and to do... Okay. Uh, that's where the extraordinary powers came from. Uh, it had been a bill that had been amended specifically for a pandemic, but it was, it was already on the on the statute book. What was nice, though, about the, the, the bill is that there was a, a sense of collaboration between the parties in taking right. it through Parliament. And that was that set the tone for the next two years of um, Parliament trying to work together to attend to this um, national disaster. OK. And so you're, you're working as a whip working with the legislation, moving the legislation through, which you could argue would might, well, one may argue, I don't know, that that could be quite dry in some respects. I guess there's obviously a lot of human contact and trying to figure out how to get things through. But how did that translate into this? What happened during that process that ended up in such a passion for the areas of particularly like preventative where I know you campaign and things like that? Well, um, the between us first having the heads up, there might be a problem in at the beginning of January and May, March 23rd, when lockdown happened, there was this huge change in attitude because we had no idea at the beginning that it would be as severe as it was. And in fact, the country was focused on implementing Brexit. So, yes. so we didn't have the eye on the ball to begin with at all. And so we were quietly putting in place preparations just in case things deteriorated. And that's what made me realize two really important things. Firstly, that on the public health side of things, we had very much neglected uh, the key components of a national public health strategy, having the right data, uh, having the right behaviors uh, amongst uh, the population, um, uh, and uh, also having the right diagnostics in place, having having the right tests. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then secondly, um, uh, I, I then began to realise that we didn't have um, a very healthy population in the UK at all because we were carrying so much obesity and all the comorbidities around cardiac, respiratory and other functional health 
we, we had a population that was really ill prepared for a coronavirus. And that made us really vulnerable to being hit hard compared to younger, fitter populations. And, and that's really where I began to realize um, that, that, that that was the central mission of, of the British health strategy. It should be to make our country healthier so that we are more resilient for pandemics, but also so that we are more productive and have happier lives. Well, I mean, that's, that's exactly why we founded PopTalk and why we focused on cardiovascular disease to begin with, which is still the UK's biggest killer. I think it still was the UK's biggest killer through, through COVID, even, even despite COVID. Um, and yeah, I completely, I completely agree. I think that there's, it's unfortunate that after the pandemic that we got hit with the current economic crisis, right? It sort of seems like we just can't get out from under our feet a little bit and, um, and get focused on those priorities. However, the NHS is talking, is talking about them, right? Well, it was very interesting. Um, Chris Whitty gave us a little bit of a pep talk right at the very beginning about what happens with pandemics. Uh, he, amazing, he said amazing. something that, I know, he's an amazing guy. Amazing. So he said a couple of things that really stuck in my mind. Firstly, he said that the second wave will be bigger than the first wave, which seemed okay. an extraordinary thing to sort of like think about. And I don't think I really believed him, but he was, he was right and about what, that. And what was, why? I don't know. What, it always what, is. Is it? It just always yeah. is. So, the, so two or three things happen. One is that behaviours change. People, people are very reluctant to continue to be locked down. Okay. And then secondly, the, the virus mutates and it often right. becomes more efficient. Right. Okay. Okay. So that, that, that's things. why why you have waves and and then uh, and then the other thing he said is that pandemics are followed by um, war and inflation. He specifically said that. And that no way. Said, he actually said that. War and inflation. There's cost wow. price inflation because of the disruptions of supply chains, and and then um, uh, the pandemic itself brings about both so social pressures and opportunities for for aggressors and they often step up to the mark is that right that's incredible i never knew he said that that's amazing yeah <laughs> that is quite prescient is it not yeah spot on yeah bonkers so on top of everything else you've got that to worry with yeah so we we knew the other thing he said which was very interesting is that he he said that after the pandemic people won't want to think about it it is part of the human condition yeah, that, that like mothers and childbirth, if you you don't, you you erase it from your brain, and I think one of the um, difficulties I have at the moment is that I'm very aware of what we should be doing to build up our public health and our, our um, the, 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 and to improve our the healthiness of our population. But people really don't want to hear about um, that right at the moment. And in fact, we've we've dismantled a lot of the infrastructure. That we built up during the pandemic um, around diagnostics and around vaccines, and we are very reluctant to look hard at what we should be doing on the public health. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. One of the we have a, a partnership on, on the side of PopTop with with Novartis, and one of the things that we're looking at around um, with them is um, taking over some of the um, vaccine centres, unused vaccine centres for cardiovascular screening. So using the PopTop five marker smartphone based lipid test. Um, you know, and trying to get that rolled out there because there's a lot of that spare kind of capacity out there. Um, and I, I think the other thing that that I, I mean, I would definitely agree. And that every, I mean, look, sample of one, but talking to people it, it, who I know, it's there's a, there's an element where you, it's almost like your brain makes it hard to remember that period of trauma. Yeah. And so so, so I, I went in to see some of our hospital partners uh, this week in um, in, in, in Chelsea, Westminster, and. Um, that there was a compulsory mask wearing. I was like, oh, mm. I remember, I remember that. I like, like, it's, I know, it's not nice, nice, is it? Well, no, but it, and it's it's just a it's a weird kind of echo. And then you realise that actually, for a really long period of time, that was the norm. But you still, it still seems that we're so far culturally away from that again. It was very, very strange experience. I, I'm very excited that you're doing that work with Novartis because I think there is an opportunity to have what they call warm resources in place. So if you have a really active program of diagnostics and vaccinations in society, and you're processing people on day-to-day -day tests of the kind that you described, when the pandemic comes along, you have that infrastructure in place. Yeah. Diagnostics, the vaccines, the data, and the behaviors, those are the four things you need. Yeah. Now, you can't magic those things up 
from nothing. No. And nor can you have them sitting there cold, no. waiting to be used. That that doesn't work. No. You need them ticking over, yeah. doing public, achieving public health outcomes. And scaling them up isn't so difficult, but but starting from scratch is it's really hard. So painful. Yeah, it's we very it's and very, very, very hard. And so um at what point, I don't know whether you were involved or not, but I thought it was a very good idea that came out of the end of the pandemic around these central diagnostics hubs, yes, the NHS yeah. diagnostics hubs. I thought that was an eminently sensible plan, but I don't know if that was something that was was concluded as part of the pandemic work or whether it was already sort of in process anyway. They have a long legacy. Uh, Aradarzai um, uh, talked about them in, in his review 15 years ago. Mike Richards, uh, in his diagnostics review, had, had also posited them. Um, and um, our experience in the pandemic was that people don't want to go to hospital. They, and, and this comes as a bit of a surprise to, to some in the clinical discipline. What do you mean? You don't want to come to my lovely hospital? I yeah. know, I really don't. It's full of yeah. horrible disease and it's depressing. So yeah. taking tests to people was something that you know we, we worked really hard on during the pandemic, so the, the so the penny has dropped. I personally think it's a shame that we're not running harder at that. I, I, in fact, I think if we if we ran harder at community diagnostic hubs, we could be spending less on modernising our hospitals and taking more medicine to the places where people like to be. Um, I think that the initial ambition was a hundred, and I think we've done up eighty six of them. Yeah. I kind of think there should be. 586. Well, I mean, I, so the way that we, I mean, we're, we're doing whatever we're doing. We work with, we, we, you know, we work with private and public. And one of the things we're doing on the private is scaling out through community pharmacies. You know, so like, yeah, even a, a 300 chain pharmacy is considered a small chain pharmacy. Yeah. You know, like, so 80 hubs is, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a pharmacy on every street or on every high street with at least one, di- with at least one consulting room, right? So you know that that's sort of how we're. That they, those things have physical plant, physical bricks and mortar. They're there, pretty much. They're they're, they're going to be a fixed feature of every community. So that's sort of how we viewed it. But I I agree. I mean, p- people want access. That's what we found. Right? It's 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 often yes. There are some people that don't want it, but the majority of people do, and it's more of a a lack of convenience, for want of a better word, that gets in their way. You know. It's yeah. sort of like well, I, I can't take half a day off work to go to the. I just can't do that. I've got you know. Uh, if uh, I can stop out or do no, it, Steve, I think you put it very well. And I, and I I learned an important lesson during both test and trace and the vaccine about what what was previously termed hard to reach communities to right. so people, and and that might be uh, people of a ethnic or religious background or people in a, in a rural area or people in areas of deprivation that they, they are multifarious but but typically there are there are loads of groups and communities who we have very very through cut very limited cut through with the nhs and we we call them hard to reach as though it was their problem that we didn't yeah. get through to them <laughs> yeah, like the exactly. 40s yeah. yours yeah so we banned that phrase yeah. and we and we gave i won't go through it all but we gave real thought on how do we how do we get uh, rates up amongst it? And we did. I mean, we yeah, we figured amazing. it out. And and it was usually about changing the model and taking tests, vaccines, um, engagement to those people, learning their language, figuring yeah. out what barriers there were, and overcoming them. Yeah. And we got all the rates up to so the rates for vaccination amongst, for instance, for the Muslim community or the Hindu community, which we were very worried were going to be really low, are, are astonishingly high. Yeah. Um, just as high as it is amongst all the other communities. Why? Because we took the trouble uh, to figure it out. So I, I think that's a real lesson for uh, the healthcare system. Yeah, and I think that, that that's why we developed PocDoc in the way that we did. We always had a vision of just, we have you have to go where the people are. You, you, yeah. you, 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 putting up a poster in the GP surgery, making people aware of heart health, it's not really going to cut it. I know. You know? And look, and, and actually... GP surgeries are so backlogged that they can't do that type of stuff anyway. So, um, yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. And so what has your involvement in health kind of evolved into? And then we'll go for a commercial break. But obviously, pandemic, are you still involved in that role or have you evolved it onto something else? No. So I, I, I left government a year ago 
uh, I'm still in the House of Lords. And that's where um, uh, I've got the focus of my effort. So um, work very hard on the uh, health and social care bill um, uh, and included in that with the ICBs. And it would be interesting to talk about population health and what we're, what we're doing in that. Yeah, uh, well, and I'm engaged in trying to be a champion uh, for prevention in the round. Now, it's tough yards at the moment because the system is red hot, running red hot. We've got terrible challenges with waiting lists and ambulance times. And so uh, uh, the innovation agenda and the prevention agenda feels like a, a secondary priority. But I, I can't not. help feeling that that's exactly the wrong response. Wait, I, I mean, if you're pushing yeah, it hard. I agree. And I mean, look, I, unfortunately, yeah, like you said, there's, we're, we're, we're in a tough spot, clearly. And the, the healthcare system's in a really tough spot. And the people that are working on the front line are doing an amazing job. Um, but I think a lot of them in the system would say the same thing as you, which is that unless you focus on solving these issues before people get to hospital, or at least trying yeah, to, yeah. then you will be forever locked in perpetual kind of crisis mode. Exactly. Cool. Well, look, we can pick up on all of that after a commercial break. So we'll be back in two minutes with um, Lord Bethel, James Bethel, who is a um, um, health campaigner and former Minister for Innovation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this week's Health Tech Hour with, with me, Steve Bruce, and my guest today, uh, Lord Bethel. So, uh, James Bethel, welcome to the... Uh, well, let, let's get back into it. So before the show, we kind of covered off some of your work and, and the inspirational work that you did during the pandemic and how that kind of inspired you on a sort of a broader journey around healthcare, um, but particularly a few areas. So why don't we start with what you mentioned before? Let's start with social care, which is something you mentioned, the health and social care bill. Social care has been in the headlines well, for, for for a good number of years, I, I, I would say. I mean, and, and so how, how have you been interacting with that? And what do you think are the kind of major issues at play there? Well, if, if social care wasn't in, in my um, brief uh, as a minister, but I did uh, form a lot of opinions, partly because we were trying to keep the disease uh, out of social care. Right. Listen, it, it's, um, every every um, developed country is having... Uh, a big challenge now. It, it is really great that people are living longer. The biggest challenge we have is so many of those years of, of later life are spent in illness. Yep. So from from my, my particular take on this is to try to figure out ways in which people can live longer, healthier lives and not go into their later years carrying terrible diseases and, and morbidities that that mean that um, they need support in, in looking after themselves. I, I regard long life as a, as a huge benefit and a boon and an opportunity. But for a great many people, it means relying uh, on a very fragile care system. And that fragile care system in itself puts a lot of pressure on the health system because the health system is given the wrong priorities and the wrong responsibilities for caring for people who should really be in their own homes and given a different type of support. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you about this long life thing. So whenever I see these things around, you know, people saying, oh, I'm going to, we're pushing the boundaries and we think people can live to 110 or 120. It's like, great, I'm sure you can get people to that level, but what's the quality of life will have been like for the last, their final 30 years or 20 years, right? So like, if what you're saying is you, you're you just, if, if you're healthier, let's say you're almost like a 60 year old by the time you are 80 for example or 90 yeah. then sign me up man i mean look all day long right but if 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 it's just you're you're in the health that you are when you're 85 but you live for another 30 years then i'm probably not so keen on that you know well some people who are 60 have the bodies of an 85 year old right uh, exactly how, how does that work i think that we have to prepare for the 100 year life and that preparation needs to start much, much earlier. I, certainly in my own life, uh, I'm doing things now with my physical and mental health that are deliberately preparing for living longer and trying to be as healthy as I, I possibly can be. So I take now really seriously um, my mental health. So I do a lot of wild swimming and cold water swimming all through the Oh, winter, nice. Yeah. Which is I'm, my yeah. particular passion. Um, okay. And then physically, I'm, re I'm just much more careful about my eating and my exercise and and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, I have to take my statins because I have high blood pressure and 
previously I wouldn't have thought of doing that, but uh, now I'm right. really, really disciplined about it. Right. And I think that that stuff. So, how on on the wild swim? I'm a big I'm a big fan of wild swimming. How cold do you go normally? The last winter I went down to four degrees, so I went all oh, the way. Nice. I went all the way through the winter, okay. and I found that if you acclimatize on the way down, it's not it's not so bad. So I went yesterday at ten degrees, and I did half an hour. So I did. Five, oh, that's pretty good. I'm quite a slow swimmer, I must admit. So I did five hundred okay. meters. It took me half an hour. But are you um, presumably you'd like just swimming trunks, right? Not wetsuit, right? Because that's right. I wear little neoprene booties. Yeah, the same as me. Yeah, yeah that's partly because right. it's muddy and disgusting, and partly so my toes don't get cold. And it, when it's very cold, I wear gloves yeah. and a hat. But no, I, I, um, yeah, no, no, no wetsuit. Yeah, I find it exhilarating, you know. But I agree with you about the um, you have to go down. You have to kind of go step by step. So where I am, I think I'm going to go after this actually, um, and it's probably going to be like 10, 11 degrees. Which is like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long I've been for, but yeah, it's, I, I, I don't know. I find it quite. Um, it's definitely a challenge to force yourself to go in. So I get a kind of an, uh, sort of a big mental lift after having done it, as well as whatever physical benefits there are. No, and, and and have you thought about doing an ice mile? What's an ice mile? An ice mile is swimming sixteen hundred meters in four degrees or less, and it's wow. a little bit of a battle that your body is getting colder and slowing down. So you're, right. you have to swim <laughs> fast enough that your body doesn't stop altogether. <laughs> right, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> and in order to do it in an in a, uh, environment, you have to have an ECG beforehand. Really? To, uh, yeah, to check your heart. Is in, oh, in that wow. Where, have you done one? No, I haven't, but I'm, I, uh, I, I'm tempted, but my family are dead against it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dead being kind of potentially yeah. <laughs> fairly um no so what's a, what's a much so fit, so yeah fit, i mean even even in a pool 1500 meters right takes me 20 20 to 25 minutes right that's so yeah, when that's you're colder a, it'll that's, take that's a, a 50 percent longer that's a long old time at four degrees yeah so about take about 40 minutes <laughs> that's um yeah wow that's so it takes about a year of acclimatization so you have to go the full wim hof and okay. take ice baths every day um, oh wow okay yeah that's that's a big that's a big commitment um that's a big big commitment so to the point around you know people taking more care of themselves and things like that how do you think that that kind of aligns with different socioeconomic groups and health inequality and things like that do you, do you see what I mean like because obviously people that are, have more economic capacity are in theory able to live healthier lives in I say in theory because it's not always the case right but so how, how how do you think about sort of layering that that concept of inequalities over that over that I, I, well, listen, it, 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 I think it's a massive massive national challenge because undoubtedly uh, those of the um, lower deciles of deprivation have got much worse health outcomes. Uh, and in fact, in terms of healthy longevity, the numbers for the bottom four deciles have actually gone backwards rather than forwards over the last 10 years. Okay, which is I didn't know that. utterly hard. That's scary. But, but, it's, but speaking as a politician, it, it's hard to know exactly how you address that. Because the, the, uh, you know, Michael Marmot, um, tabulates and, and um, bears testimony to the lives that people lead and wh why it is that those statistics are going backwards. Okay. But the positive solution is that we provide some kind of minimum wage for people so that their lives of poverty have changed. But I can't see how, as a country, or even um, spiritually as people, a, a basic minimum wage is ever going to to fly. I'm not sure if that's a good idea. Do you, do you mean, but, but no, but you mean do you mean universal income, or do you do you mean? Yeah. Um, okay, so because there is obviously minimum wage, minimum standard, minimum, minimum wage, wages, so, a, base, yeah, yeah. a basic income. So yeah. I think we have to. I think we have to pick these did things they, off. Did they? Um, did they, so they trialed that in Scandinavia, right? Did they? How did it, do you know how that went? Like a universal income? Did it not so, work that well? Opinion opinion is split, but my observation is that people begin to lose a sense of purpose. And right. my, my view of the world is that w we are born to work and that work is a validation and a, and, and a honourable thing to be doing. And were we all to sit around not working, we would go to pot. And I don't think that is good for your mental health. It's just not a, 
not a right. sustainable long term solution. No. So we have to we have to figure out ways of getting everyone in society more engaged in their life, and and, and we have to look carefully at the trauma that people have as children that can have really that can have effects on their broader mental health and and how that relates to things like obesity. The mm-hmm. people who are carrying these um, very difficult um, um, experiences from their childhood and how that leads then into later life, um, either lives of abuse and addiction around gambling, drink, drugs, food, or um, uh, hypertension and stress. It means that people make terrible decisions and are, and are, and are carrying um, a, a sense of um, doom that, that erodes their, their, their life. So I think that the, the, the challenge is partly physical and getting diagnostics hubs and vaccines and yeah. treatment into people's lives. But there is also a case for a spiritual renewal. And I know that, that sounds very grand and, and Victorian, but it means making, trying to address the family lives that people lead, the communities in which they live in, the work that they do, uh, and the environment in which they, they're working in, um, in order to have a, have a shot at improving um, their, their long life outcomes. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And so how would... Um... You know, how would something or where would who would decide or who would push that forward? Would that be a government thing, an NHS thing, a council thing, a kind of grassroots community or a bit of everything? Or what, you know, I don't know. What do you what do you think? Right. So I think it is a bit of everything. But one one catalyst, one very important thing is that our politicians have gone down a cul-de-sac of equating health, the health of the nation with the number of hospitals there are and the yeah. waiting lists for those hospitals. Yeah. And so when, when, we have a politi- when we have a national debate about health, we start talking totally bizarrely about waiting times and hospital rebuilds. And, and if you're okay. an MP or a, or a councillor, your, your health manifesto is, I will save the hospital, I will reopen the maternity ward, yeah. I will get the waiting list down. I mean, it's, it's, it's bonkers, and it doesn't address the, the issue any more than building more cemeteries would, would right. address the issue. The electorate isn't right. very interested right. in hospitals. It's just become a political um, cipher for trying to express commitment to the health system. So right. instead, what I think there needs that to be sense. is a conversation that is more, along, uh, more about um, improving the health of people. So I would love to see people saying, where is the vaccine for, for my children? Where is the diagnostic test for my parents so that we can have an early intervention on emerging dementia? Where, where is the um, health check for, for me because I'm in cancer snug rally and I want to catch it as early as I can? Mm-hmm. So, so, we, so that, I, that preventative agenda that could exist. Now, I, I have a personal experience of this, which is that I looked after test and trace and, and medicines during the pandemic and i can tell you that was politically quite tough you know people yeah, didn't I mean, like testing and they didn't really want to hear about the, the medicines but my colleague nadine zahawi yeah who looked after the vaccines did brilliantly everyone loves the vaccine everyone loves right. nadine zahawi yeah well, people do value preventative health and politically there can be a a positive story about the benefits of prevention it doesn't yeah. all have to be about nanny state and 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 no I think that freedoms. In a weird way, I think that that like under that massively undervalues the the the, the intelligence of 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 the of the population, right? It's like oh, you know, vaccine good, diagnostic nanny state. Like it's that's oversimplification, and it actually completely undermines the spectrum of concerns that people have and and about health, which is obviously eminently personal. But but also like just just from doing what we've been doing, you know, so even before we started, when we were doing our very first, we were trying to figure out what company we were going to start and how we were going to get into this. So my own personal story, my passion for our company comes is my my dad, when he was 43, had a catastrophic stroke um, that was related to undiagnosed cardiovascular disease. So no testing, hypertension. Um, high cholesterol, but didn't just just wasn't the thing that you, there was no testing. He just didn't mm. just wasn't access to it. Preventable, clearly preventable, and it had a catastrophic impact throughout our entire family. He spent two years practically in bed, 
long subsequently you know huge health issues um and so I, i've always really been passionate about um investing or, or helping people make investments in their health to prevent future problems right and, and our view was that uh the biggest issue around cardiovascular disease that we could solve was access to, to, to testing that was sort of our whole piece of it and so some of the first things that we ever did were very simple off-the-shelf cholesterol tests in you know businesses of of friends that we knew right we just sort of rocked up and we thought well if we put a little flyer out that says would you like a free cholesterol test let's just see how many people turn up let's just have mm. a let's just let's just have a look and we were just overwhelmed by really? people just overwhelmed any single office we turned up to and we weren't even a company right yeah. we just we, we we weren't even a thing it was it wasn't <laughs> like booper showing up with the big booper truck yeah. Right, yeah. it was just it was just little old us, yeah. and um, yeah. and then and then we were like, and we were talking to them. It's like, why why have you done this, and why are you here? And they're like, well, I, I know about this stuff. I'm worried about this stuff. I want to get this stuff tested, but because for X reasons, Y reasons, I just haven't been able to get around to it, or I can't get an appointment, or I think I won't be able to get an appointment, or I tried to get an appointment, and the person said no, we don't do preventative testing, yeah. whatever. But you're here, so I'm here, and this is great. Like it was universally popular. So again, I, I think to go back to something that we talked about earlier in the show, it's not um it, it it is definitely not that people don't on the whole want to engage with health. Now clearly there are some people, there will be obviously that are fit in that bucket. It's a it's an access issue, a convenience issue, a price issue. It's it's not and if you took it a view which is if you were running a business, you would try and figure out where your customers are, who they are, what they look like, where they go. And how do you access them and how do you get them, right? That would be what you would do. You wouldn't think, well, what we want to do is just put posters up and then people should come to us. And if they don't, then, you know, they don't. That's insane. So, Steve, that's a very moving story. And thank you for sharing that with me. I, I, I completely resonates with me. And, and um, I think there'll be a lot of people listening to this show who have had or, or experienced similar kinds of stories and just the frustration of... Of illnesses that are that are so easily preventable. Um, I think that there is two things I'd add to that. One is that there is this amazing technological revolution going on. Yes, yes. And and we're just not taking advantage of it. It's absolutely astonishing. My, my mobile phone improves every year, mm -hmm. but my experience with my GP is pretty much the same as it was when I was a child. Yeah. Um, and instead of bringing health technology into the home and, and making it all better. Um, uh, the system is struggling to keep up and it's just not embracing innovation in the way it, it should. And then in terms of behaviours, you're right, I think it is primarily an access, but there's also an expectation issue that people kind of wait until they're peeing blood yeah. until they go to the doctor and they yeah. think that that's acceptable. And that's yeah. totally bonkers. It's like driving along with a in your car with a sort of loud banging noise. Yeah. Um, uh, I used to have a uh, Alfa Romeo, which I loved very much, but it fell to pieces almost every month. Very unreliable. <laughs> uh, very unreliable. Uh, particularly 20 years ago. And, you know, in an Italian engineer used to, you know, mend it with a sledgehammer and a chisel. Yeah. Um, whereas now my Audi has got a computer and, you know, you, you yeah. plug it in and it never goes wrong. Well, yeah. people's expectations are still at the sort of um, Alfa Romeo stage <laughs> rather than the yeah. Audi stage. And I think right. that, the, but I, I, I think that's a door that's ready to be pushed open. I really do. Yeah. So let's, um, we're going to go for our final commercial break now, and then let's come back. Let's talk about digital technology. We can finish up on some population health stuff, which I know is a particular passion. And if there's anything else you want to cover, but let's, let's pick up on the digital technology piece because I think it's really interesting. Um, digital technology in the NHS, right? Because it's not an unknown. And actually, the NHS does try. There's a number of programs. We've benefited from some, the NHS Digital Accelerator, the National Innovation Accelerator. There's pots of money available, but it's it's certainly not as easy as it could be. So um, let's let's pick it up. So we'll be right back in two minutes with Lord Bethel for the final part of this week's Health Tech Hour. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost, and my guest, Lord Bethel. So before we, um, before the break, we, we kind of touched or started to touch on digital technology and is it being used at the capacity that it could be used in the NHS? So I think your view was that there's a lot of headroom there, basically, you know, to summarise of where we could move into. And so what do you think the best way is to go about trying to sort of 
move into that 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 space because there are things like Innovate UK, which is very good, um, SBRI, which is another grant funding body. Like, so it's not like it's something that's kind of unknown. It's just not as efficient. Is that what you mean? It's sort of I don't know, just doesn't quite get yeah. there, or what's the? Well, so if you ask me that one of those impossible questions, like, you, know, <laughs> you explain nuclear fusion, or where do we? Well, come I mean, it, or just an opinion on nuclear but fusion. But let, let me get, chuck in a couple of logs on the fire just to sort of get things going. Yeah. Um, uh, firstly, I would agree with you that there are a lot of people really trying to push this agenda really hard, and I pay tribute to to the um, science networks, to the AAC, to the universities who are trying to push this through. There's a lot, a lot of effort, and we are. We are in some ways better than some other countries. But there, I think there is something broke. And if I was going to single one thing out, it would be culture rather than system. Okay. I think that unfortunately, there is a risk aversion in the NHS at the moment. Um, and we could spend all, you know, an hour talking about the reasons for it. I think partly it is because everyone's so stressed trying to operationally optimize to deal with the scarce resources. I think that the patient safety agenda, which has been implemented from a sort of top-down, clunking fist kind of way, has paralyzed people and, and demonized professional judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is a, a just a fun, fundamental fear of change that builds on some of the natural professional conservatism of the yeah. health professions, but has got us to a place where uh, the system is paralysed. And, and the stories I hear from innovators of how phenomenally difficult it is to get any adoptions to the tools, not the innovation that's the problem, it's the adoption. Yeah. I, I find heartbreaking. I really do. Yeah, it's tough. And, I, you know, as an innovator, I can tell you it's tough. I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of it that's understandable, right, in the sense of patient safety and risk management and stuff like that. And I, I totally understand that. What, what, there, what there isn't is an, there's two things that I think are really missing. One is almost like when you do, um, you know, when you develop software, you have what's called like a sandbox environment where you can operate in a way that doesn't damage anything, right? And and so there's no that that, that doesn't exist really at all. Yeah. So there's no easy glide path in, so that you you can sort of put something in that may not be quite perfect, but it can't do any harm in that environment, and we're all agreed that the risk has been managed and so forth. It's like you're either absolutely huge with the big fat with everything done um by the way you have to fund yourself to get to that point yeah. with no guarantee of a contract basically before you can even have a conversation so that's one issue and then the second thing is around um scalability right so just because you work with one ccg you may never work with another ccg i know there, there is there is no there is no pathway for that and that's that's what's very very difficult because it's hard enough to work with one and then you still have to go and talk to another 215 of them or how many they are. You know? yeah, <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's not. It's, so those are the two issues I see. Well, uh, that, that's right. And, and ironically, the answer to some of that will be to get rid of the central control and to give more, more autonomy at a lower level so that there is more scope for experimenting, experimenting and, and innovation. But we have to change the culture in which that happens so that if you do get through to one or two CCGs and you've got a proof of principle, others will readily fold in afterwards and, and take as yeah, like so, take yeah. at, at face value the endorsement of their colleagues. Whereas at the moment, you have to go through the whole yeah. you know, ver validation and verification shooting match again. And yeah, you do. And every clinical have, director feels that you have to start at ground zero. And it's, yeah, and they all have their own individual opinions. And they all have, and you, you know, there's documentation that's same, same, but different. And you have to do it. It's the same thing. You have to do it differently. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's, it's tricky. But there's definitely willingness in the system. And actually, the pandemic has been hugely helpful. So a lot of the conversations that were difficult before the pandemic are now yeah, taken yeah. as just understood. Well, it, it, it demonstrated what you could do, yeah. um, albeit with a bit of central oomph and a lot of money being made available. Yeah. It also showed that when you do do it, it makes an, an astonishing impact. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I am, a, I am what, what I get frustrated by and why, why I am leaning into this area so much is that I see so much power innovation. Uh, I'm I'm seeing like a complete transformation, particularly in the preventative sciences. Yeah. Yes, in the in the treatments and the and the and, and the molecules, but but particularly in the genomics, the AI, the 
data, the diagnostics, yeah. uh, all, uh, and also just basic population health um, systems. But that's the area where we're really struggling to take advantage uh, of, of, of the tech revolution. I would, I would agree. So um, we've come to the, the end of the show. Um, so great to have you on. I have one more question. Well, two, they're kind of connected. So um, we haven't talked about the, the jungle. I'm a celebrity. I'm just going to do this at the end. It's not related to the show, but <laughs> were you? Let me start with this. Were you surprised when you saw Matt on the bill for that? Was that you were shocked, or do you, you, you know, I don't know. Did you see it coming? Well, um, I had a couple of days heads up, but listen, it, it was tough for Matt. He, Rishi didn't give him a job. Plan A, which was you know to go down the sort of mainstream politics, got close for him, so he went for Plan B. And so, no, it wasn't a total shock. What a plan B. Um, yeah. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> um, yeah, no, look, so he came on the show uh, and it was a great interview and, you know, got, got, got a lot of time for him. I just thought I would, I would throw that in at the end. So anyway, Lord Bethel, thank you very much for coming on the show. Much appreciated. And, um, you know, we'll be back again next week, everyone. But thank you very much for listening. Dude, thank you very much. And thanks for sharing uh, your insight and your personal experience has really touched by that.